In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we're going to get all up in Intel's architecture. We're going to be talking about the Galaxy Note 20. We're going to be doing some quick mentions on some other things like the Google Pixel 4a and Main Gear's tiny but mighty Turbo. Next. Welcome back to yet another fine episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Dave Altavilla, and with me, as always, are the knuckleheads, Marco and Chris. Marco Chipetta, Chris Getting. Marco, uh, you feeling extra knuckly today, knucklehead? Uh, that's the perfect description of me today. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. <laughs> that's all I'm getting. <laughs> I figured I'd get a little bit more. Okay. Chris, Chris, do you subscribe to the knucklehead culture? I might as well. I'm hanging in there. Yeah. Yeah, we're a little loopy right now because we've been busting tail all week. As you've noticed, probably it is Thursday and uh, Thirsty Thursday, having a um, Sierra Nevada torpedo, Chris. I am for beer. having coffee. Coffee. Yes, I should be having coffee because I'm tired and there's still work to be done. Marco's uh, probably hydrating with branch chain amino acids or some other healthy beverage. Uh, just a little bit of H two O. Shout out to Hydro homies. H two O and some sort of really fruity looking glass. Well, okay. you know, got to play the part. <laughs> yeah, we've been crazy busy. It's been um, there's been lots going on. Uh, Intel's Architecture Day happened today. Uh, actually, it happened a couple of days ago, but um, we launched it today. We launched our coverage of it today. And um, so lots to, to, to discuss there, easy for me to say. Um, but we've been running flat out with product launches too. So uh, the folks at Samsung have uh, some cool things on tap that Marco will talk about. And uh, Google's got some value propositions on tap. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's good stuff. How are you, uh, how are you liking the, uh, the tech scene these days, Marco? Generally speaking, we, we tend to get a lull right about now, but haven't felt it, right? Yeah, I'm feeling like this is, um, there's a lot of pent up, I don't want to say rage, there's like pent up releases coming and stuff is going to get nuts in another month and a half or so. So like lots of the stuff that we were able to disclose for Intel Architecture Day, those products are going to come to fruition. Uh, I, I suspect the GPU guys are going to have some news soon. Um, we have lots of phones coming in based on Snapdragon 865 Plus. So yeah, it's going to be an insane back to school slash holiday season, I think. I would agree with you. Chris, what are you keying on soon on the horizon? What are you, what are you, what are you looking for? Um, well, obviously, we've got whatever Intel is coming out with, with uh, Tiger Lake and everything else to look forward to. Um, the NVIDIA next series, whether it's 3000 series, or some people are saying maybe 2100, probably 3000 based on what they did, I think. Um, <laughs> AMD, Big Navi, uh, there's definitely a lot. And then even outside of our normal sphere, looking into camera stuff, as we've seen the Canon R5 and R6 launch, the Sony A7S III, um, just incredible cameras and more to come, I'm sure. So uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting tech this year, even if the rest of the year is uh, as nutty as we are. 2020 has been a bit, yeah, yeah. Nutty would be uh, putting it kindly, I think. I Anyways, um, but you're right. We've got lots of things going on. And, and actually, yeah, before we move into to the coverage notes here and, and, the, and the topics at hand, stay tuned in, what was it? Was it September 1st or 2nd? Um, Jensen Wong already announced a GeForce or, yeah, was it a GeForce event, right? Or do you call it a GeForce event or a gaming event? I think it was GeForce event, right? It was G it was a GeForce yeah, event. Yeah, yeah. Something's coming. Trying to get the the wording exactly. Yes, something's coming. We all know what it is. Going to be Ampere, but we can't say that that's officially. But I mean, come on. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> take a wild guess. <laughs> take a while. It's only been leaked nine ways from Sunday, right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's talk about. Uh, let's run down the. Um, the bullets and the headlines and the reviews we've got going on for today, uh, as as noted, Intel Architecture Day, Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. Let's start with the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. 
and, uh, and the Note 20 with Precision S Pen and UWB support. It's got all the vowels and consonants, UWB. Um, there it is. It is a, a big, bold um, uh, phablet, dare I say, Android device from the folks at Samsung. If you're a Note lover, uh, Marco, is this is this a Note lover's dream? Because it has a bit of a following, the, the Galaxy Note does. Yeah, so we're not quite allowed to post full reviews yet, but um, I'll, I'll hold it up because we were allowed to do hands-on. I, I happen to be running the, the battery life test right now. So this is the Galaxy Note 20 Ultra. This is the big boy, the 6.9-inch with the 108-megapixel camera. Um, I'm going to put this down because I don't want to ruin this test right now. It's a, It only takes, you know many hours to complete this one so when you screw it up it's kind of a pain <laughs> but yeah you know the, there's some subtle changes some big changes but overall my my initial hands-on impression is very positive so if you were to compare the note 20 ultra to the note 10 plus the previous gen big boy note 20 ultra is slightly taller the camera bump out is significantly thicker. Like you can't lay this thing flat on a table. You're gonna need to put it in a case. But now in terms of specs this guy is basically loaded for bear. It's the leading edge phone platform that you can get right now. So uh, processor platform is Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 plus 5G mobile platform. Now that's essentially the same as the 865, but goosed up clocks by about 10% on the CPU and GPU side, which results in about 10% uh, performance uplift overall. You got a 6.9 inch display up to 120 hertz with adaptive re refresh rate. Now I should mention though, you do not get adaptive refresh if you're running the screen at its native uh, 3080 by 1440 res that only runs at 60 hertz at that res but if you drop it down to the full hd the 2880 res it will do the adaptive refresh up to 120 hertz so big honking 4500 milliamp hour battery in this guy eight gigs of ram and 128 gigs of storage on the note 20 but uh 12 up to 12 gigs and 512 gigabytes of storage on the note 20 ultra and you also have that nice i believe it was a 12 megapixel selfie cam i don't remember exactly and triple camera arrays on the back. So 100, <clears throat> I'm choking over here. 12 megapixel wide angle and 108 megapixel main monster shooter on the Ultra. Um, two 12 megapixel shooters and a 64 megapixel uh, on the Note 20 non-Ultra on the smaller one. But overall, in terms of fit and finish, you know, typical Galaxy awesomeness. Samsung did move the S Pen location. They moved the buttons <clears throat> to the other side as well. Um, and the S Pen has been upgraded too, so it's really much faster latency. It's like a 40% improvement in latency down to 9 milliseconds. So that's somewhere where you do notice. If you're writing on the screen, it's it's smoother and more responsive that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, nice upgrades for sure. Uh, eager to, to see how they... Um how the camera worked out with this with this device um i think the galaxy s series the s20 series um had a few <laughs> issues early on especially relative to the camera cameras excellent but there was some uh, color balance issues and things like that that were i think mostly resolved but it'll be interesting to see what uh, what samsung has done with the camera on this what what's your gut saying you know, relative to kind of the whole package so far. And I know it's not a full review. It's just first impressions kind of stuff. But, and, and this is your jam, right? Like this is your kind of phone. You like the notes. Yeah. I mean, my the note 10 is my, my daily driver note 10 plus. <laughs> so initial reactions are, are, are positive. Um, the, the, the camera bump out is, is really big. Now, you get that really nice 50x super zoom, and I think it was the 10x uh, optical zoom. Maybe it was 3x. I have to go double-check the specs. So there is a real optical zoom. So that's why the bump out is a little thicker. You get that you know, no loss of resolution zoom where you don't get that on other phones. So that's nice, and there's a price to pay for that. But I, I really feel like you absolutely have to put it in a case. If you if you plunk this thing down on a desk, you can make it wobble, and it's just it's just really thick. You don't want all the weight sitting on the on the corner of that camera bump out there. But the fit and finish is awesome. Screen is awesome. <laughs> Initial reaction to the experimentation I've done with the camera is awesome. Um, I've I've completed one battery life test. 
um, at the adaptive refresh rate, and it's looking pretty good. This one is running at the high res 60 hertz right now. I'll have that number soon. But yeah, you know, reviews are under embargo for about a week. Um, I think sometime next week I'm allowed to publish. But if I were to boil it down, if you like the Note, you're most likely going to really like the Note 20 Ultra. So I don't have Dave's audio any longer. I do not either. That was my bad. I muted. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Sorry about Wasn't that. Wasn't my fault for once. There, Chris. Um, it, it, I was going to say, you know, a note, the note is an acquired taste, I would say, perhaps. Um, you know, folks that like really large format phones. Um, and Samsung does some pretty amazing things with displays. I have to admit, uh, you know, of all the handsets on the market, and I've seen, you know, virtually every brand from, you know, everybody, um, LG, you know, Google, Motorola, you, you name it, just on and on and on, um, seen them all, and they make the best displays. What are your thoughts about <clears throat> the Note 20 standard versus the Ultra in terms of its display setup? So the waterfall curved edges on the Note uh, 20 ultra that you have versus the standard a lot of folks are kind of like ah man we got waterfall again it used to be that those little curves were you know sexy curves were sexy sexy but they're not so sexy anymore it seems for some folks yeah that's a uh, it's not an issue for me the note 10 <clears throat> plus has the waterfall edges i don't mind it i actually kind of like it because at night i'll flip my phone over and you get those notification you know the light notifications around the rim um, without any noise, you know, or distractions coming through, let's say my smartwatch when I'm trying to go to bed. So I don't mind it at all. I could see why somebody would want the completely flat screen, especially in terms, like, in, just in terms of protection when it's in a case, just to to make sure all of the the sharp edges are protected, and when you drop it, you have a little bit more of an edge to protect the screen. But I don't know. That's that's like a minor thing to me. Like well, I've been around since you know cell phones weighed a pound and had a bag so like <laughs> all of these are like literally i used to sell bag phones when i ran my radio shack years ago wow. so like these are all beautiful machines to me and i i really like the note 20 aesthetic if the notes i see i gotta back up i was gonna get early hands-on with both devices unfortunately the tropical storm that passed through the northeast put the kibosh on that so i didn't get to play with the non-ultra note 20 yet you know, if it's significantly smaller and smoother, I could see people choosing it over this, especially since I think the 108 megapixel camera is completely unnecessary. It's not really 108 megapixels. So like the in terms of ultimate resolution, the 64 megapixel is most likely fine for everybody. It's going to produce almost the same exact output. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think the curved waterfall is a big issue at all. Yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, for me, I, I wasn't ever really into the, the curve, the, the utility of the curve, um, you know, and, and some of the features you talked about having it on the nightstand and, and, and notifications coming across. Um, and, and so I've always had an issue with, okay, my, my display, my content is falling away on the edges a little bit. I notice a little bit more. Um, so I'm not as much of a fan of the curve, but I think Samsung does it pretty well. It's pretty subtle. And uh, that still is a gorgeous display. Chris, what are your thoughts on the Note 20 Ultra? Is this too much phone for you or, or uh, yeah, would, you, I, would I, you rock that? So I feel like I'm becoming a bit of an old fogey because I see these flagship phones and they have, you know, admittedly cool features, premium builds, but I kind of don't care about that. I, I'm much more interested in the mid-range four or $500 phones. Um, With battery. I, I, right. Battery life. And I'm... I don't really need a great camera on my phone. I mean, the only thing I use my phone to take pictures for is like to take a picture of some notes or, you know, documenting stuff. I'm not taking them to post to Instagram or anything. I have a DSLR for that. So, you know, as long as I can get to my email, I can do my messaging, I can browse the web. I'm pretty happy. I, I like the size of the large phones. Um, I've got fairly large hand so it works it's a little easier to see things and fit more on the screen so it helps with productivity um so i do like that but i don't feel like you necessarily need all the bells and whistles in a phone to get that and i also know with that camera bump putting it a little asymmetrical that would bother me but 
I have start put it, started putting cases on my phones, so probably less than it would have bothered me a few years ago when I ran all my phones naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I think for sure it's, again, it's it, the Note series tends to be an acquired taste. Folks that care about that S Pen, and there are plenty that do. People love it. There's there's a bit of a, a cult following, mm-hmm. certainly, I guess I would, I would say, for the Note. Um, but, yeah, it's an impressive phone, and it'll be interesting to see uh, and hear Marco's take on it um, from a guy that, Uncle Marco, that heralds from the days of bag phones with... 20 watt power supplies <laughs> dude it's funny man those phones you put out three watts and yeah, like today's phones are like milliwatts so like people like we're just carrying a three watt transmitter next to their body <laughs> them up your head <laughs> exactly you know <laughs> oh good well hey let me tell you what at the other end of the spectrum and you should stop by hot hardware for this one we'll mention it quickly is the google pixel 4a which um <clears throat> for for chris might be a little bit I'm not sure how, how it plays out for battery life, but if I look at that and we can pull up uh, Miriam's review. Miriam Joie actually did a nice review for us on the Google Pixel 4a. It is an exceptional value for the money. Here it is right here. Let me try and not blow out the screen, but it is it is a small format phone. Um, and uh, it is it is a whole lot of value for the money. Um, 349, um, MSRP on this puppy and 5.8 inch full HD display, six gigs of Ram, 128 gigs of storage, Snapdragon 730G, uh, which gives you, you know, good performance, acceptable performance. It's not going to compete with Snapdragon 865s. It's it's at the bottom of the, um, you know, the benchmark graphs versus 865 series devices. Um, But most folks, you know, quite frankly, you know, especially with six gigs of RAM on board, you know, a healthy, healthy RAM complement and, um, you know, speedy storage, most folks really, you know, that's enough horsepower. And so if you're not gaming, if you're not doing anything heavy duty in in terms of, uh, I don't know, maybe some crazy filtering or something for, uh, you know, photo manipulation or something like that, that might take some additional graphics horsepower. Um, this, this phone actually holds up really well. Um, performance wise solid. And I guess experience is what Google has nailed. Um, I'm a fan of pixels. I really, really like the pure Android experience. This phone is too small for me. Um, it's a little bit too small. I like that Google has finally figured out how to get the, the bezels down to, uh, almost nothing. And, uh, if you're okay with the, uh, bullet hole camera in the front, um, you know, you, that, that's that's an efficient setup for a for a 5.8 inch display. It's a lot of display in a little bit of area. Marco, you were snickering. What were you snickering at? You said it's too small for me, and I was going to drop it. That's what she said, and I held myself back. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> rough crowd, rough crowd. Even even my compatriots, man, unbelievable. Sell me out, but yeah, no, it. You know, really, it, the the thing about about pixels as well that Google nails every time lately. It seems like from the Pixel, probably the original Pixel 1 to the 2 and and the 3 series, now the 4 series cameras. I mean, absolutely stunning camera performance, especially in low light conditions. You still get that along with pure stock Android. It's really, a a, you know, for $349, it's it's kind of a steal, relatively speaking. Um, You know, you've got uh, plastic composite construction. You You don't have metal, but a lot of folks... Really, you know, they're not big on the metal as well. Um, you know, the thing about metal is it scratches, or, or with glass, uh, you know, glass backings, it scratches, it breaks. Um, plastic is a little bit, perhaps a little bit more durable. Certainly with the, the matte black finish on this guy, um, almost fingerprint, completely devoid of fingerprint uh, magnet issues. So, um, yeah, man, 349. It's, uh, it is Google's uh, iPhone SE, right? Basically, Something yeah. Like I mean, for for that for that money, it's a fantastic device. And I'm I'm sort of if I wasn't so spoiled doing what we do and getting my hands on the flagship devices, I would totally be looking at stuff like the Pixel 4a. Like that's basically, you know, that flagship feel with that premium software experience for literally a fraction of the price of the flagships. You know, and the experience is still very good. So, yeah, I, I dig it. Yeah, less of a concern, I would think. Um, for for folks that are looking for a budget friendly phone, 
is the lack of 5G support. It does not have 5G support. It doesn't have uh, Qualcomm's Snapdragon 5G modems. Um, but um, short of that, and let's face it, right now, 5G coverage is pretty sparse. If you wanted something to carry you for the next year, excellent buy. Can't beat it. Um, you know, if you want to get on the 5G bandwagon right now, I think Google's got some some things in store. They've announced the uh, Pixel 4 uh, 4a 5g or maybe the 4xl yeah. 5g i'm trying to remember 4a 5g 4a 5g yeah okay and the and the the 4xl um or i should say that the next generation pixel 4 is coming as well i'm forgetting what that is too but um yeah lots of uh, lots of good stuff in the land of phones and also swing on by the the site for the asus rog phone 3 um if you if you like big format phones with a serious amount of horsepower, and I think we may have covered this briefly in the last cast, that would be the um, Asus ROG Phone 3. Um, it is a seriously fast Android. We've said the fastest Android phone in the market currently based on Qualcomm's Snapdragon 865 Plus processor, um, 16 gigs of RAM in our phone, LPDDR5 RAM, 512 gigs of UFS 3.1 storage. I mean, fast, fast phone. Big honking 6,000 milliamp hour battery. Check out the full review. I dropped it into the, did I drop it? Yes, I did drop it into the chat. Um, we won't stay too much on that. <clears throat> um, but uh, let's let's shift gears to the land of PCs uh, from phones and talk about um, something here that uh, briefly, and then we'll get on to the sort of the the grand finale, the, the, the real uh, centerpiece of our uh, podcast today, and that would be Intel's Architecture Day. Lots to talk about there. But before we do, let's talk about something, frankly, that's AMD powered. And that is the main gear turbo. I'm going to try and pick it up. It's uh, it's small enough to get on screen, but it's um, it's pretty dense at like 30 pounds. So here's the main gear <laughs> turbo. All right. Can I get it into the frame a little bit more? Up. There we go. Don't drop okay. it. Wallace is watching. Yeah. Wa is Wallace watching? Is that <laughs> yep, he's there. I drop it. <laughs> now, see, you don't have it plugged in and lit up. So. No, it's not. It, you're not going to go to the next level. Go there, dude. It wasn't going to go there. But there's the main gear turbo. It is 26 plus pounds. Not crazy heavy. I mean, I'm getting a bit of a workout. You know, I, I got the, the curls going here, but I'm handling it. I'm not breaking a sweat yet. And uh, but but this thing is based on AMD Ryzen. I'm going to put it down on my desk. Hang on. <laughs> okay. This thing is based on AMD Ryzen 3000 XT series technology for the processor. So 3900 XT specifically inside this machine. Uh, 32 gigs of RAM, you know, fast DDR4 RAM, 3600 megahertz memory. Uh, one terabyte NVMe solid state drive. I mean, loaded for bear with that 3900 XT, um, you know, processor with a little bit of extra turbo boost. So that, you know, sort of main gear sort of rolled this out, you know, in concert, I guess you would say with AMD's Ryzen, uh, 3000 XT series processors with a little bit extra turbo headroom. So turbo and turbo processors. What impressed me most about this machine <clears throat> was what Main Gear was able to pack into a mini ITX form factor. And that's what this is, is built on as a mini ITX uh, platform. Um, from the all, you know, custom closed loop liquid cooling that's, that's on board, the multiple water blocks, the distribution blocks, um, it is just a work of art. And it's, um, of course... RGB lit nine ways from Sunday, you know, and hardline uh, liquid tubing. It's it's just a really really impressive machine. Not cheap, forty nine hundred and change. And the config we got also has a four terabyte uh, hard drive for for bulk storage. Um, but can't say enough about how well the folks at Mangear can put together a high performance PC. As far as boutique. You know, system builders go, high performance PC builders go. These guys are, you know, dare I say, the Ferrari, the Porsche, the 
you know, t- pick your pick your supercar. These guys are that of the PC building world. Um, just blows me away. I have a main gear vibe as my main system. Actually, over here to the to the right of me right now, uh, sort of illuminating the the right side of my face. Um, and uh, it's it's a fabulous machine, a full 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 ATX mid tower. But um, this little mini ITX is just impressive. The other thing that was impressive is it, it puts up performance on par with any full-size desktop that, you know, with those kind of components on board, obviously 12-core Ryzen with extra top-end boost and gobs of RAM and NVMe um, PCI Express 4 storage, it's going to fly. And it did. It it smoked all the benchmarks. It's right up there in the top, you know, you know, five percentile or something like that, and sometimes winning a few here and there too. Um, but it's quiet. Like, you know, I think I was able to – I. I pegged the CPU and GPU simultaneously and tried to get the pumps going inside the, the machine to, you know, spin up, you know, what I could for fans and, uh, and, and liquid pumps. And I think I was able to squeak 50 DB out of it, which, you know, at full load is completely, completely bearable, completely manageable. It's not, not annoying at all. Uh, ambient in the room was like 35. So just for relative, uh, metrics, um, good stuff, impressive, Marco thoughts, Chris thoughts. You jealous? I still have it. <laughs> I mean, I no, love that, that, that thing is freaking awesome. So you know, I'm I'm partial to the smaller form factor, really high performance systems. Um, I know lots of people look at them and they they feel like there's a sacrifice when you go small. But if you're not the type to be constantly pulling crap in and out of your systems or adding cards or messing with them, there's, you're really not giving anything up except for some expansion possibilities down the line. So those tightly packed, really dense, powerful systems, that is right up my alley, and that thing is gorgeous. <clears throat> yeah, it's a nice machine. You make a good point. I mean, full full candor, you know, to be completely honest, you are not upgrading this machine or you know, um, swapping out the GPU easily. Um, it's tight. It's custom. You know, when you buy a config, buy all you can, you know, make your decisions carefully if you decide to go this route with, with main gear. Um, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tight. It's custom. It's, it's, it's a complex machine. It's super efficient. Um, I will say that, you know, from a power and cooling and, and acoustics perspective, that's the upside benefit of, of the complexity of this machine. Um, but it's not, you know, completely insurmountable either by any stretch. I mean, it has on the top of the main distribution block, a nice accessible fill port and a drain port down the bottom right there. So if you have to, you know, maintain that, that, that liquid after a while, it, you know, might get a little gunked up who knows years over time. You want to, you want to flush that out and, and replenish the liquid, the cooling liquid. Um, very easily done so you've got that but yeah unless you're unless you're you know one of two things unless you want to send it back for service and you're you know you know funds are not an issue or you're comfortable with mucking around in there you certainly can do it i I would do it i'd get in there marco i know you'd jump in there uh i probably wouldn't man i don't want to mess that thing up no i'm a while (laughs) i'm a big goon (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i would too but you know certainly you know with the latest uh x570 chips at motherboard and you know amd ryzen processors on board um geforce rtx 2080 ti graphics card by the way the fastest of everything you can put in this machine you can get a 3950x if you want 16 cores in there as well um yeah configure it loaded for bear and then don't touch it for a while because it looks too beautiful but you could you could. I'm just saying you could. Chris, what are your thoughts? And then we'll move on. You, you know I love M- ITX systems. I love the small form factor, the tiny size. And when you get the liquid cooling in there, the thermals don't matter nearly as much, especially when you have your radiators in all the right place. Yeah, it's going to be tight to work in, but when you have that much custom piping in there, as you said, you're not really going to be working on it anyways unless you need to do a swap or something with a already set of component but you know i think that's a sacrifice that's worth making in many cases for a system this beautiful when when you're getting a boutique system you're getting almost a conversation piece for your office or your living room or wherever it ends up hanging out um and it's definitely a work of art i mean you can you can make all the comments you want about performance per dollar and this and that but that's that's not why this system exists 
It's there to be pretty <laughs> and kick ass. And I think yeah. it delivers at both. Yeah, good good point. And you're right. I mean, pe- you walk into the room and people be like, what is that? <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of experience. But Wallace is in the chat, actually. The CEO of Main Gear actually decided to join us. Good to, good to see you again, Wallace, however virtually. And he makes a good point. It starts at $14.99. So there is a standard... AIO, you know, off the shelf, all in one liquid cooler version of this without the custom Apex liquid cooling that is in this machine. That's what I showed you. That's what's in our review. Um, the standard AIO liquid cooled machine, standard, uh, you know, uh, air cooled GPU, it's all standard components, um, very serviceable and accessible in, in a mini ITX frame. So you do have that option. If you go for the Apex liquid cooling, that's what you're signing up for. It is, um, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a feat of engineering, I guess, is a way to describe it, right? Intricate. Yeah, man, it's a gorgeous little machine. They really, they packed a lot of nice stuff in there. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. By the folks at Main Gear out of Kenilworth, New Jersey, and uh, in the Northeast here with us. We like, to, we like to spend some time with those guys and uh, see what they've got cooking. Good to see you, Wallace, and Ron Reed, and... All the guys down there in uh, in New Jersey building good stuff. There it is. It's actually uh, it was doing the acoustic test there, 50 dB. That's all I could, all I could get out of it. it was, Not bad. It wasn't Not bad at much all. At all. <laughs> so all right, let's let's move on to the uh, the grand finale and uh, finish up strong here with uh, Intel's Architecture Day 2020, Intel's Tiger Lake 10 nanometer super fin and X. E GPU arsenal exposed. So Marco and I got a uh, freaking brain melting drop <laughs> <laughs> from the folks at Intel the other day, right? And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, there was a lot to unpack, and we hope we, we did it justice. We tried to get it all into one big long page. We tried to sort of hit the high notes and keep things condensed. Uh, and succinct and digestible as much as possible. But th- th- there's no doubt that these sorts of, when you talk about architecture, uh, semiconductor architecture, it's deep and you're going to go deep and it's it's going to take time. So <laughs> it's a lot to unpack. But um, yeah, good stuff from the folks at Intel. We were, we were impressed. We came away impressed. Um, I think, uh, y- you know, it's, it's obvious and, and goes without saying that Intel has had some issues currently with uh, the you know the 10 nanometer process node and then announcing the delay of the 7 nanometer node as well um, but they stepped right out in front and got ahead of the fact that uh, 10 nanometer super fin their super fin fat technology is now uh, demonstrating um, a, a a full generational advancement in performance on this new processor technology. So they are basically realizing the full benefit of 10 nanometer and then some. It's actually working out <clears throat> to the point that um, the next generation Tiger Lake processor for laptops based on Willow Cove core technology wow. is, is, is a major leap in performance versus even Ice Lake 10th gen uh, you know, processor technology from Intel. Uh, and that's saying something because Ice Lake is pretty potent with Gen 11 graphics as well. Marco, let's let's dive in, pick a spot. You know, what are your thoughts about Superfin? Seems like, you know, and, and, and I should say Tiger Lake is the first to employ Superfin. It uh, was not in Ice Lake. What, do, what are your thoughts about this initially and then uh, how Intel is positioned competitively moving forward? So, um, first of all, you have to come by the site and, and read the article and check out all the slides. There's way too much to talk about uh, in the podcast. Like, literally, we could spend the rest of the show talking about just one aspect. But we've got, you know, new new processor architecture, new process stuff, new GPU news. Um, there's so much in here um, that you absolutely have to come by the site and check the article out. So, that, that out of the way, I think the 10 nanometer uh, super, uh, super fin news... Um, was important because everybody seems to think, you know, 10 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers, 7 nanometer. Mm. And, and that is just not the case. There there are differences in everybody's processes. Now, no surprise, Intel has had major issues getting 10 nanometer out the door. So the first wave of actual, you know, consumer product, Ice Lake, that took way too long to bring to market. But now we're, you know, we're approaching a new processor architecture with 
Tiger Lake and its Willow Cove processor cores. And it seems like all of those speed bumps Intel hit allowed them to wring quite a bit of uh, extra performance out of their transistors with these 10 nanometer super fins. So essentially, Intel has tweaked, you know, the metal layers. They've added, a, a, you know, a metal capacitor, changed the, the gate pitch. And these, you know, super fin transistors have less leakage, uh, lower resistance, you know, increased strain, and they can drive higher current. So all of that basically means you can drive higher frequencies at lower voltages, get more performance, save power. So when you, if you've seen any of Intel's presentations, they say Tiger Lake's got a wider dynamic range. That basically just means you can get higher clocks at similar voltages to previous gen, or save a lot of power at similar voltages. So that's really, you know, good news across the board. And in, in, in because of the issues they've had with their processes lately, that's important news to get out first. That's why they they opened with it. And it's really, you know, we've heard rumors on that Tiger Lake was going to be really strong when it launched. And this is basically the reason why. So Tiger Lake's based on, the processor cores are based on an architecture called Willow Cove, hmm. which the foundation is Sunny Cove, the same as Ice Lake. Now, they've changed the cache hierarchy and they've made some tweaks to the architecture, but fundamentally, it's it's a refinement of Sunny Cove. But performance is looking you know, much better across the board due to the process enhancements that are allowing for higher clocks and better power. And then, of course, the new GPU, which is, you know, greater than 2x faster than Gen 11. Yeah, yeah. And and actually what occurs to me also with uh, with Willow Cove co cores and the architecture that's in Tiger Lake is that Superfin or the process technology, this this um, evolution of the node and, and its advancements allowed for more robust resources. So in Tiger Lake and in, in uh, Willow Cove, there's a dual ring bus now, um, uh, ring bus that um, essentially a fabric between CPU, GPU, and memory structures in in the device, in in the in the processor. That dual ring bus increases bandwidth by two x, provides serious um, gains in memory bandwidth, and really allows them to you know feed the cores, many different cores, CPU, GPU, what have you, more efficiently. And that's, you know, when, when you say, oh, no, oh, by the way, there's there's increased beefed up and optimized cache architectures as well. So there's additional cache on board. When you say there's more room for, for another, another ring bus, additional cache memory and optimized cache memory, that's process that gives you the ability to to deliver that to to squeeze that into the chip and so yeah that 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 one two punch of processor uh process uh advancement as well as architectural advancement is what makes tiger lake so potent and we we, we you know we hope to be testing it soon not you know not sure if we have a a good feel for when that exactly will be um, did, did we get an idea when, when the first Tiger Lake uh, process was shipped? Did, did we, have we heard that before, Marco? I, I'm not sure we could say, but I would not be surprised if we had some numbers it, within a month or two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not far. Let's just say, put it that way. It's not far away. And so, yeah, like in, in Tiger Lake, <clears throat> you know, from a, from a CPU performance standpoint, I think it's already been... It may have already been officially stated, but we've heard major gains in in IPC. So, you know, single thread, you know, performance not not scaling over multiple cores. When you when you add in multiple cores, obviously it's you know it scales with it. But that single thread IPC, that IPC for the CPU is going up significantly um, with Tiger Lake. The other thing that's going up, as you know, to Marco is is Gen twelve graphics performance um mainly because again i think i think process involved here now you've they've got the ability they've built um and there's a 50 percent larger uh gpu so 96 execution units with tiger lake gen 12 graphics versus gen 11 at uh, 64 eus in xelp graphics for for tiger lake right yeah so the the, the graph mm -hmm. so basically 
you know, before we we dig into XELP, the graphics core that's built in here, mm. if we if we boil things down simply, because you know, Tiger Lake also has new I/O, so Thunderbolt four, PCIe four, USB four, full spec. What Intel has done with this platform, um, based on what they've released, they haven't released all the full specs, but you can get data into and out of the processor much faster, sometimes 2x faster. The processor can play with that data much faster, and it can output the results much faster. So like feeding the beast, processing the data, getting data around the chip, getting it off is all much faster. So this should be a killer platform, not only in terms of absolute performance, but in responsiveness. I'm really looking forward to playing with it. It's coming to mobile first. So that first wave of ultra of ultrabooks is probably going to be really awesome. And now, the XELP graphics also, you know, what to consider. Dave mentioned 96 EUs in the XELP graphics. There's also, you know, a, a, a new L1 cache for the GPU. The 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 pipeline has been re-architected for performance. The the driver has basically, well, the DX11 driver has been built from scratch to, to be optimized for performance and local memory when this becomes a discrete GPU. But there's basically no part of it that hasn't been touched. Faster, um, you know, a much more capable media engine, a much more capable image processing engine, and just overall much more performant GPU. Intel's uh, saying 2x performance versus the top Gen 11. You know, and that's a big deal because Gen 11, you know, Iris Plus graphics in the 1065 uh, G7 were pretty good. So now you double that, you add more features, you add, you know, another year of focus on graphics driver development you know intel is taking gpu very seriously right now then you add the the process improvements what you're going to see is ultrabooks that are decent gamers at 1080p now, that's really cool you know and potentially i mean you're not going to get awesome battery life gaming because an ultrabook's going to have a small battery relative to a gaming notebook but you now can have this sleek gorgeous you know xps class slim awesome machine that can also game you know it's it's it's, it's great in the boardroom and it's great in the bathroom <laughs> you know so <laughs> i'm really oh, looking forward really looking forward to the platform <laughs> oh you can and we, we need to we need to coin that i think i think uh, intel's gonna just like come to you for for marketing rights on i that am a marketing <laughs> genius <laughs> god help them but but um you know yeah you you make it you make a good point they actually demoed battlefield one um playing on uh tiger lake on 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 a 15 watt tdp roughly uh processor and, they, and it you know it's scalable tdp as well of course but they showed it on tiger lake and it's playing at 1080p no problem so um you know high image quality settings so um yeah uh, it's going to enable gaming you know capable machines in thin and light form factors and new form factors and aaron in the chat asks wow that's going to be amazing in your opinion gaming wise will it still reign supreme um you know <clears throat> i i i will i'm interesting to see how tiger lake's going to match up against uh ryzen 4000 in in notebooks that would be an interesting matchup but if you do the math like like isn't isn't ice lake pretty pretty nip and tuck already with with ryzen 4000 so i have to, I'd have to look you know, at that if you look at single thread performance which is which is important for responsiveness and for gaming right <clears throat> intel if, if you run a, a slew of games on on ryzen and, and intel and i'm talking i'm talking desktop right now just you know where there's no thermal constraints um intel technically has the lead for gaming processors. At least my testing, most people are going to say that it's not Unibel does have the lead for gaming. Now, Aaron, what's what's really important to consider and something that we didn't go too deeply in the article because we were under the gun, but something to think about is during the Architecture Day presentations, they said 15 watt or maybe it was 7 watt to 65 watt or, or 15 watt to 65 watt. 65 watt uh, Tiger Lake is absolutely not a quad core mobile processor. A 65 watt Tiger Lake is probably, probably, this is unconfirmed in speculation, an eight core desktop part. So if you have a 65 watt Tiger Lake desktop part with eight cores and all of these IPC enhancements that's unrestrained by the thermal limits of a notebook, it's probably going to kick ass for gaming. I'm speculating, but I'm semi confident in saying that. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually I was, I was on a different uh, track and I think, I think you were on the right track with Aaron there on that question relative to CPU performance. I was thinking integrated GPU performance, um, you know, mm -hmm. so Tiger Lake, uh, gen 12 versus Ryzen 4,000. I think Intel's going to be in pretty good shape if those numbers, I mean, if it's two X ice lake, right? Yeah, I think it's going to be strong. Yeah. Now we still don't have the uh, the H series um, AMD notebooks to play with yet. I think they're running a little late. I think I was supposed to have one at this point, yep. and I don't. So you know, with the additional power headroom, we can't really compare the integrated GPU what we've seen so far on AMD because it's was it's the lower power stuff. Right. So I don't. It's it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I think if Intel's software team is on the money. And the drivers are, are doing everything they should. This is going to be a really interesting time in mobile for integrated graphics. Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think you're right. And I think um, Intel has has had an absolute stranglehold on laptop, you know, notebook processors uh, market share. And I think uh, Tiger Lake will likely help them maintain that. I'm not, you know, I'm not making any projections, but man. You know, if if what's been presented to us proves out in reality, and why would they lie? You know, I mean, like there's very specific claims, and when there's very specific, you know, claims made, they usually prove out. You know, you know, there's no caveats. There's no, you know, ranges. We're getting very specific two x Ice Lake graphics performance. You know, sizable gains versus Ice Lake. You know, with Willow Cove cores, that adds up. To goodness so yeah, yeah absolutely what 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 else on architecture day before we so wrap? I, I think we should um well we have a question from anthony we'll get to after because it's not related to this and so i think we also have to mention uh xe hpg graphics mm -hmm. so um you know we've already known intel had multiple xe gpus lined up from low power integrated i.e what's in tiger lake all the way up to hpc stuff um i.e the ponte vecchio that's going to be in the supercomputer yeah. and intel has said they will have an enthusiast gpu but didn't really outline what it was but they have now officially confirmed it the xe hpg architecture will be the enthusiast gamer gpu i i I swear I remember Raja saying this, but I might get this wrong. I could have sworn he said they're going to scale to thousands of EUs. There's 96 EUs in this mobile part. Um, potential now, I think that means thousands of cores, but not EUs. But we're looking at a much larger, more powerful desktop discrete GPU with hardware accelerated ray tracing hmm. intel has confirmed they are not manufacturing it it will be an external foundry so likely tsmc like most of the gpus out there it will also use gddr6 memory um, so it sounds like a leading edge gpu um, that would be coming from the other big boys too but I, I i believe he said late 2021 so it's not right around the corner we have some time before it arrives but the the whole point of xe with intel was to make it supremely scalable so not only do you have the low power xe gpus uh, you then have the high power xe tiles and then the tiles can also be linked so there's one tile two tile and four tile uh, xe uh, hp for the enterprise available and you know if intel has made huge huge advances in packaging and in interfaces to get multiple dies working together um, that's also in the architecture day stuff we definitely don't have time to talk about it but you know there's potential for multiple gpu dies <clears throat> to just work as a single gpu without any software craziness like sli or crossfire you know there's some really cool stuff intel has the potential to pull off if they're firing on all cylinders so interesting stuff i, I gotta leave it there because there weren't a ton of details yeah 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 well in, and i'll actually maybe correct you i'm not sure i didn't hear late 2021 i just heard sometime in 2021 did you hear late i didn't hear late uh, but well considering that there is the only discrete gpu that we know of for the consumer market um remotely that exists as a card right now is dg1 and that's not going to be sold as a card I think that there's other stuff that's going to come first. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. well, I, um, I, I could have sworn I heard late, but again, yeah, I, I, yeah. it was so fast. Like, guys, 
you don't understand oh, like brutal. get the brain dump <laughs> from multiple like the architects at all these companies we deal with are the smartest people on earth yeah and when they're talking about their stuff and you have a day to write about it after looking at hundreds of slides it's brain melting when you're just regular guys like us yeah, yeah. so yeah um Stay tuned. We'll have more. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Stay tuned for sure. Um, and yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's all good stuff. I think, I think it's nice to hear the progress. Um, I think on, on the high, high performance, the XEHP side for the data center, they're already, um, you know, they have it up and running in the lab. They also said HPG was up and running in the lab. Um, but it's for silicon. It's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of ring out when you talk about a big honking GPU, uh, whether it be data center gaming or otherwise, um, there's there's a lot of ring out that goes with that. So, um, and I think that's perhaps why um, Intel went to the external fab with this. And, you know, we didn't get a, a lot of color behind that. Uh, Intel's pretty guarded, as any any semiconductor company would be about their their manufacturing um, strategy. Um, but we know GPUs are very complex designs. Um, I, I, they didn't say which fab. I'm going to hazard a guess it's DMC, TSMC, but it, that's not confirmed. There are fabs that are very adept and experienced at building big honking GPUs, like, you know, NVIDIA's GPUs. So, um, uh, yeah, um, that makes sense to me as well. I mean, this is a specialty. I don't want to say niche, but it is a it is a specialty um, semiconductor fab, uh, you know, and, and circuit design. And there's a lot that goes into it. And you can throw a lot of money at it and uh, not come up on the right side of it if you're if you're not careful. So that made sense to me as well. Like some people might be, oh, geez, they went external. I, yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. Right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, to you want to go it, well with what's been happening at Intel and their processes. They, it absolutely makes sense to go with a you know a fab that has experience making yeah. gigantic high performance GPUs. And you know right now that's TSMC, and it could change. You know it, it, Intel is they are you know a monolith. You do not count out Intel's engineers. So who, who knows what happens in a few years? You know we were at a time. A decade and a half ago, when AMD was crushing Intel, and Intel came roaring back and crushed AMD hardcore for over a decade, you know, and now we're in a cycle where AMD and some competitors are on the up, but this stuff is not constant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really isn't. It, it is, and it's an, an interesting time in the industry. There's lots of sort of intersecting points, whether it be hardware, software, you know, platform ecosystems, you know uh the dogs living with cats <laughs> you know all kinds of crazy you know mayhem i mean when you talk about windows on arm alone you know did we ever think we'd see that you know come to fruition and 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 real um there's 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 lots going on there's lots of potential and it's exciting time it's an exciting time i think um i think we're seeing another sort of inflection point um, you know, where Moore's law carried us for so long, we're now seeing the integration of um, lots of different, um, you know, processing elements and, and engines uh, and software and just combining for super efficient, um, you know, platforms, uh, really good stuff. Uh, and, and Intel Intel stuff on, on the packaging side was pretty cool as well. We won't get into it too much because we got to close up. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're on... With with packaging too, they they talked about the next iteration of next evolution of Foveros and EMIB, and their ability to, you know, stack silicon on top of silicon and and get super density in uh, you know smaller and smaller footprints uh, in a chip. So good stuff, right? Yeah, man, absolutely. <laughs> and with that, we should probably call it a day. Chris? Let me just quickly answer yeah. a question from Anthony. Um, it's unrelated to what we talked about in the cast, but uh, he's Anthony asks, you know, could you talk about the OnePlus Pro, Pro display oh, issues I that are that. out there? Sorry, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, uh, some people were saying when they ran their screen at 120 hertz, they were seeing a green tint issue. Uh, OnePlus released an update, and then a new group of people were saying now it looks red. So. This is still in flux. What I think is going to happen based on my experience with displays and phones, it's going to turn out that uh, OnePlus's screen supplier has 
batches of displays that behave differently and there will need to be multiple updates to tune the you know, color temperature for the different batches so sit tight um, they'll probably fix it this is stuff that can be tweaked and tuned via firmware it's just they have to figure out which batches of screens have the green tint which have the red tint is it going to be a different tint if they fix that so i mean it's a yes it is a hardware issue with the display but you can tune the color temperatures of individual channels. So I think mm-hmm. I think they can fix it. Again, yeah. this is in flux. I might be wrong, but I think they're going to be able to fix it in firmware. I I have a OnePlus Eight Pro. It is my daily driver. Here it is, right here with my 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 little buddy on the on the front that passed away, Max. Um, anyways, uh, I have not seen this, um, and I get my up. You know, I, I've done all the updates on the phone. I haven't experienced this, and I use it as a daily driver. But I, I I know these things exist. Um, I'll have to dig into it and look and peer at pixels a little bit more closely and see if I can d- discern what you know what folks are seeing. But I haven't seen it, so um, yeah. And actually, one last thing, Anthony, are you talking about the color issues or the touchscreen issues? Because the touchscreen yeah. issue might be something else. Again, that yeah. might be an issue with a particular phone. But yeah, we we could go on and on. We're not going to yeah, know we until wrap. OnePlus <clears throat> until OnePlus comes clean. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll, we'll keep you posted. Stop by hothardware.com where you can find us on the web. We'll, we'll report on this as well uh, when, we, when we learn more. And uh, certainly you can find all the articles we talked about today at hothardware.com, twitter.com slash hothardware, youtube.com slash hothardware vids where you're hopefully watching us now. Hit thumbs up. Subscribe, please. Hit the reminder bell so you can get notified when we go streaming. And we'll be giving away a killer gaming rig soon by the folks at EK. EK water blocks, EK liquid gaming, actually, or fluid gaming, fluid gaming. There it is back there. Chris has got a review machine. We're giving away one just like that. Stay tuned for details and stick around in the weeks ahead. Very soon we'll be announcing. And in the meantime, thanks for stopping by.